Welcome to WebPixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of WebPixel, and we'd like to thank iClight very much for sponsoring this episode. iClight produces a very wide range of housings, ports, strobes, and accessories, and um, for pretty much all the cameras that are out there. So please go and check them out at iClight.com. Um, I'd also like to introduce Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hey, Adam. Good to see you. It's good to see you too. Um, and we thought we'd tackle a, a subject today that really came up because I recently watched an episode of um, Go Ask of Erin Quigley's um, tutorials. Um, she has tutorials on Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, and if you go to go out, go ask Erin dot com, um, a wide range of them. And I, I, and I watched a very, very interesting episode um, uh, last week about backscatter removal. And I thought that this would be a really interesting discussion. Um, in terms of how we use editing software, so on and so forth. So my first question to, to Alex is going to be, is is when does he use um, Photoshop? When when do you start editing in Photoshop? Uh, that's quite a loaded question for, for, for Android photographers. Um, I would say that I use it on every picture, which you might know. make people gasp in, in shock and, and, and horror. But for me, Photoshop is part of my standard imaging processing workflow, um, yep. which is like the majority of underwater photographers. I download my pictures into Lightroom. I tweak, I optimize my pictures in Lightroom, doing the things that Lightroom does well. Yep. But I use Photoshop after Lightroom um, in, you know, in the most basic form to sharpen the image and to output the image as a, you know, as a, instead of being a 16 bit, file yeah. coming into that as an 8-bit output file or, or that sort of thing. or And I also use Photoshop to resize my pictures to be able to share them on social media. So I think people often sort of just associate the word Photoshop with manipulation. Photoshop is a very, very highly developed imaging software. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it's a very, very good tool. And there's many things that it does better than Lightroom, yeah. including all the manipulation stuff. But plenty of things that aren't. And, and I think it's an area of big confusion amongst underwater photographers that if you use Lightroom, you're an honest photographer and everything is fine. And if you use Photoshop, you're an image manipulator. Yeah. And I certainly, you know, for example, a lot of underwater photographers feel that, you know, the, 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 the type of image that's allowed in a photographic competition well, if you can do it in Lightroom, it's allowed in a competition. If you have to do it in Photoshop, it's out, you know. There are plenty of images that you can do things in Lightroom that would get the picture kicked out of a photo competition. Yeah, and there are yeah. plenty of things that you can you know, do in Photoshop that would still be allowed in the competition. So Absolutely. I think our use of the word or the verb to Photoshop an image to imply this heavy manipulation. Yes, Photoshop can do that. But in the same way that, you know, um, you know, you know, just because you buy a car doesn't automatically mean that you're going to get caught drink driving because you also like drinking wine you yeah. are able to do the two things you know without um, without them coming together so um photoshop does have lots and lots of tools within it and many of them are excellent for our pictures and i use them a lot so i would say first of all that i definitely use photoshop on every picture i use but i don't photoshop my images if that makes sense i yeah i think it's it's a, the way we use the term isn't it but the the um for me, certainly, I think post capture editing is part of the creative process. So, so when I capture an image in the camera, be it underwater or on the surface, and that's the start of it. But I consider what I then do within within the software tools as part of my creative process. Now, that's an individual decision. Different people will vary on how they view that. But but I don't see any particular merits in not photoshopping it and producing it. Not sorry, not editing it. Be careful here. Um, and producing an image that isn't as good as one that could be. Um, as long as we kind of, as long as I kind of state what I've done to it and I, I'm honest about the effects that I've had with it, I don't really see it as being a problem. So so the vast majority of my images will have been through a very similar pipeline to yours Alex and um, you know I tend to do the bulk of my color correction for example in Lightroom um, but then I will export them over to Photoshop and perhaps perhaps a, a good um, topic would be to ask you which bits do you do in Photoshop once you've moved that or maybe which bits you do in both maybe that's a good place to start yeah well I think the first thing I would say is if you looked at the thumbnails the difference between the photo that comes out of Lightroom and then in the end comes out of Photoshop, you probably couldn't tell the difference in terms of the thumbnails of the pictures. Yeah. I'm using Lightroom, I'm using Photoshop to do a lot of fine scale things. The most, you know, the one I do on every single image is I'll, I'll sharpen the image 
in Photoshop. Photoshop has very nice tools for that. Lightroom does too, but I just feel more in control of that process in Photoshop. Yeah. Um, I also do all of my backscatter removal in, in Photoshop. Now, plenty of images don't need backscatter removal, but plenty of images do. Um, and I, I much prefer the variety of tools in Photoshop. The message I would say in terms of backscatter removal in Photoshop is there is not one tool that does it all, yeah. but there are lots of tools that have a lot of capability. Yeah. And the only way to get good at removing backscatter in, in Photoshop is to learn what the different tools are good at and what they're not good at. I personally never remove backscatter in Lightroom because I don't think the tools are quite as good. And I also like the fact that if I go and look at my files in Lightroom, I know how they looked when they were originally taken. And I find if you do take out the backscatter in Lightroom, you then maybe five years later return to a picture and go, oh, I should enter that in a competition. It's absolutely perfect, straight out the camera. And yeah. then you actually finally check the original raw file and you realize that there were three obvious blobs of backscatter that you took out that now totally ruined the picture is yeah. as an untouched photo. So yeah. for me, um, I don't ever take anything out or add anything in in Lightroom, which obviously you can't add, add things in. But I do do that in Photoshop. Um, the other thing I will do in Photoshop is I will do canvas extension. So for example, if I think I've framed a subject a little bit tight against blue water, I might make the canvas slightly bigger um, yeah. using either you know content-aware fill or content-aware cropping. Um, yeah. And I will also um, you know crop pictures tighter in, in Photoshop the same way if I want to crop. So I tend not to crop in Lightroom. I prefer to export Lightroom with the whole file there. I can then export at a standard ratio, um, a standard file size, and yep. then crop into it afterwards. So I don't, again, go back to my Lightroom catalog in a few years time and go, wow, that picture was amazing, and then realize that I've cropped it to within an inch of its life and it's totally useless for everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the, the final thing that I'll do, and, and I'll also um, use things like Content Aware Fill in Photoshop to begin to maybe do some subtle manipulation of the image in terms of changing the content way. For example, if I've got a, a wide, nice wide angle picture and some diver's fin is sticking into the corner of it, yeah. I'll use something like content aware fill to, to tidy that away in, in the picture. If I make bigger removals than something very small like that, I'll always note it in the caption. So actually, if you um, search my image library, which we often talk about here on Wet Pixel Live, if you actually search the word manipulate or um, Photoshop in the captions, you'll actually find notes where I've said in my photo caption, you know, diver's leg removed from the back of the picture in Photoshop so that the end user of the picture has a record of, of maybe what I've done. And if they don't want that in their particular publication, it's there for them to see. Um, I very rarely lose a sale because of that. And actually, the, the end users actually really value having that information. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the final thing I'll do in Photoshop, so it's quite a long list, is, is the selective work. Yeah. So if there's um, some, an area I want to mask to maybe bring up or take down, to give more contrast to, to make some selective color adjustments, I'll, I'll do that in Photoshop. I think the, the selective tools are better than Lightroom and it's easier to create masks that, you know, selections with exactly the right edges so that they blend away in lightroom that takes ages to do that well it's it, it, sure. yeah certainly certainly your, your your selecting selection tools in lightroom are, are very limited mm -hmm. um, and, and i would say you know things like edge detection you're relying on the software to do the edge detection you can't really it's very hard to do it um with um with any you know exact kind of edge detection so so like um photoshop gives you all sorts of advantages to this um you you mentioned output alex so you mentioned that you output from photoshop um do you want to explain a little bit what the, what the reason is for doing that why do you export out of, out of photoshop rather than out of lightroom um well it's partly because i don't put my process pictures back into lightroom so once they've left Lightroom, they don't go back into Lightroom. My Lightroom is, is only for raw files, and that's a decision I make because yeah. I don't like my Lightroom being a mess. I want it to be these are the pictures I took, and then I have separate cat, you know, separate um, folders on my computer with process pictures. Yeah. Um, within Photoshop, I have a number of preset outputs. You know, one is called you know high res TIFF, one is called high res JPEG, one is called Instagram JPEG, one is called PowerPoint JPEG for example, and as I just load my high res file up, one click, it's in the right folder at the right size, 
all optimized in the right color spaces for those different uses. Yep. And I think that's something that the workflow is super fast in Photoshop. It means that, you know, if I need to send someone a picture for them, you know, to to use and I need it certain size, I can get my original process TIFF file, open it up in Photoshop and very quickly and produce the app sure. and send yeah. to them. Yeah, um, and, uh, and, and actually, I I actually keep both a full res TIFF and a full res JPEG of all my pictures anyway. So I already have those two to hand. But if I want to share a picture on Instagram, it's one click. It's there. It's in the folder and click. It's uploaded onto Instagram. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And or, you know, or yeah, and I, I'll use that size for all my social media. I'm not so fussed about the other, you know, but it's, it's a good size. So I like that size of Photoshop that you, you've got those quick commands. Um, and, and there's lots of things you can do for that. And particularly as a working photographer, maybe when a magazine says, can you send us X number of pictures? Don't send us the high res. We want them at exactly this size in this color space. You can just make a quick action in Photoshop and then it's one click and they're all done. Yeah, um, I think, so, yeah, I like that automation in Photoshop. I think the actions, I think that's something that often is, is, is not talked about a great deal, but Photoshop, you can actually create effectively automated processes um, via creating an action. It's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Um, and once you've done that, you know, if you've got a batch of photographs or you've got a, a photograph that's going to be used in different, it, 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 or a photograph format that you want to use in multiple different ways, you can just create an action and just drop the drop the, drop the file onto that and it does it. And it is, you know, people often get worried about Photoshop taking up time and certainly you can absorb a lot of time in Photoshop. Uh, yeah. But but um, equally, you know, when it comes down to it, you can actually be very efficient with it as well. So it's designed as a graphics design package. And that, what also, finish point, Adam. I, I, well, what, I was going to sort of divert a bit, really, and and, and oh well, then then I'll just jump in quickly, yeah, then, yeah. or you change the topic. And I would say that if you looked at my typical workflow over thousands of images, I spend probably only ten percent of my time doing the Lightroom stuff, yeah, the Photoshop. But in terms of the look of the image from where it starts to where it finishes, Lightroom probably does. 80% of the change of the look. Yeah. So you can very quickly in Lightroom, correct the color, correct yeah. the contrast, you know, give yeah. the clarity, get the picture working um, and all those things. Yeah. And the thumbnail that comes, or the, you know, the, the, if you look at just the thumbnail size image that comes out of Lightroom, it looks exactly the same as the finished image. Yeah. I will then go into Photoshop and tidy things up, you know, uh, you know some of the, the level of backscatter I want to remove, I'll take that out. I'll make sure that, you know, the bits that I want to be sharper, as sharp as they should be. And, yeah. and that sort of stuff, particularly the backscatter, is quite time consuming. And yeah. so I would say, you know, processing a light picture in Lightroom, you know, less than a minute. Processing it in Photoshop, seven or eight minutes. And yeah. that's why, you know, it's, um, but in terms of how it looked coming into Photoshop and how it goes coming and going out, if you look at the thumbnail, you probably couldn't see a difference. But yeah. actually, I've done a lot to get the most out of the file in that process. Photoshop is the finishing school, isn't it? You know, mm. um, um, you know the, the light, Lightroom is the Lightroom is the education. Photoshop's the finishing school. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I was going to mention. I, mean, I, I there's a couple of graphic artists that I who produce underwater work that I, I really love their work. Um, and obviously, their work is, is basically driven by. The, the compositions that are their creations that are created within Photoshop. And I have to say, I have absolutely no problem with that as a creative tool. You know, if someone turns around and produces pictures of devil rays in trees and it looks great graphically, you know, I, I, I'm absolutely hundred percent behind that. And I, I, I think, you know, as long as we, you know, that's obviously a fairly extreme example because it's fairly obvious that, that it has created in Photoshop. But I think, I think we should, obviously be prepared but i think that you know it's all about the image at the end of the day and um, and you know how you achieve it, it's up to you you have the creative freedom to do it however you want to do it as you're, long as you're you're honest. Saying, you know every it's the everyone's creations of their art and it's up to them what they want to do with it you know? yeah yeah i would uh, say from a, a photography perspective is that if you are sharing those images with other photographers i think that a photography audience likes to know a bit where they stand so i yeah. would say you know, the level of manipulation that you choose to do is, is very much up to you. But I would say within your community, I think of underwater photographers, I think it's valuable to communicate what you've done. Yep. And, you know, when I've presented manipulated images and I've been honest and open about what I've done, I've often received incredible feedback from people saying, you know, actually, you know, I really respect you more for saying how you've done this. Um, than if you just pretended you'd got this exactly like this out of the camera. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that that actually has a real payback for you. Yeah. I do think, though, we, we trip ourselves up a little bit as a community because I see people who do tons to their images in Lightroom 
really loads and loads to it and then sort of share their images and kind of say as a badge of honor, I can't use Photoshop, kind of trying to imply that their image is exactly as shot, when actually they've done far more manipulation using Lightroom than the average underwater photo has done on it. Yep. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I think that is a mistake in, in our language to, you know, sort of have this implication that if you've done it in Lightroom, it's, it's absolutely fine. And if, you ha if you've used Photoshop, it, it's completely wrong because people are often doing more in, in Lightroom than, than people who are using Photoshop. So I think the, the wise photographer is, is accepting those Adobe products as one workflow. Yep. And the level of manipulation is up to what they want to do, not them pretending that because they can't use Photoshop, they clearly haven't manipulated anything um, because that's often very much not the case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, I think I, I know Alex is on the same page with me on this. I think you know if you want to find out more about the nuts and bolts of processing, um, Erin Quigley's tutorials are a great place to go. Go ask Erin dot com. Um, you know she she does does um, some amazing stuff. And, and I have to say the one that I watched last week, I learned some new stuff. So so thanks, Erin. Um, Alex has been exporting pictures, so we can see them on his website or we can see them on Instagram at Alex Mustard. Oh, no, Alex Mustard me. One. I'm Alex terrible at this. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Alex Mustard One. So I'm go sure check him out. Search my name, that you'll find me pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, true enough. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Yeah, it'll be amongst amongst the people you follow, I'm sure. So thank you very much, Alex. Um, and I'd like to thank Icolite very much for sponsoring this episode. And um, we need the sponsors to help support us to make these. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please feel free to add some comments in the comment section and to drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Mm -hmm.